Hello, everyone. As Mark said, uh, my connection to the Institute uh, here is that Mark was a visiting student in my research lab uh, at the Media Lab um, for a while. And it is incredibly exciting and I'm really proud, I have to say, to see that that same interdisciplinary playfulness, creativity, passion, active building of prototypes is um, that is really at the core of the Media Lab's success is very much alive here in Paris at the Institute. And I hope you all get a chance later to, uh, this afternoon during their open house uh, to absorb some of that um, innovation and creativity. So another reason that I kind of feel at home here is that I grew up just an hour and 15 minutes away from here by train, TGV, <laughs> um, in Brussels. Um, I actually did uh, the second uh, PhD in artificial intelligence in Belgium a long time ago, <laughs> uh, working with Luc Stales, who some of you may know. And um, after I uh, finished my PhD here um, in Brussels, in Europe, I joined the MIT AI lab to work with um, the founders or some of the most important people in artificial intelligence, Marvin Minsky and Rodney Brooks. And so I did a lot of work there on robots that learn uh, and teach themselves tasks like walking and so on. And it was a very exciting time. But after a couple of years, I realized that I wanted to move towards the Media Lab, a different laboratory at MIT, because I wanted to shift my focus from AI, artificial intelligence, to intelligence augmentation. Personally, I am um, actually much more motivated to help people become more intelligent and to increase people's potential rather than trying to create um, uh, basically humanoid robots or AGI, general intelligence, etc., and build machines that are possibly designed to um, at least match or sur uh, surpass and possibly replace uh, people. So I find that artificial intelligence, especially these days, and we can talk about that maybe later, is very misguided because it is uh, so focused on um, uh, basically replacing people with smarter machines, rather than thinking about maybe the other point of view of how can we use some of these same technologies to make people super smart and, and have amazing uh, performance and potential. So that is what I've been focused on for my 30 plus years at uh, the Media Lab. One of the things I started with 30 years ago is I looked at how smart uh, systems and AI systems and statistical systems and so on can actually help people provide relevant information so that they can improve their decision making. And uh, very early on in my career, um, we invented recommendation systems in my lab and collaborative filtering, which is actually now used in many e-commerce websites to give recommendations to people based on their behavior and their taste and how that correlates to the data from uh, say thousands or millions of other users. Uh, we were a little bit early with that work because there were barely any e-commerce sites around <laughs> at that time. But we did start a company which we later uh, sold um, successfully to Microsoft. We also did projects like the Remembrance Agent. You saw the picture that Joe showed of the wearable uh, computers group um, that was very active at the Media Lab um, in the uh, 90s. And one of my students, Bradley Rhodes, 
was focused on how can we extend our own memory, make our own memory more perfect by having a system uh, with us that constantly can give relevant information from previous conversations or from things you may have read. Um, so he had this wearable computer. This was before smartphones, by the way. <laughs> Cell phones just had been introduced. And um, he had this wearable computer that would constantly, based on where he was, what room he was in, who he was talking to, what topics he was talking about, it would give him maybe uh, web pages that he had read about the same topic or notes he had taken in previous conversations with that same person. It was a little frustrating for me, his advisor, because his memory was perfect. And so he would come into a meeting with me and I would say like, you should be doing this or something. <laughs> and then he would tell me, well, actually three weeks ago, this is what you told me. <laughs> and it's, you're contradicting yourself. So it was a little bit unequal in that his memory was so perfect. Um, after that, we looked also more at how can we integrate interfaces into the real world around us. Because it was becoming clear when smartphones came out in 2006 that we were increasingly living in this fragmented world where we're living in the physical real world and we are also dealing with the information world on our phones. And I wanted to combine the two worlds better. And we did that with projected augmented reality so that if you, back then we had paper newspapers, by the way, <laughs> if you picked up the newspaper, it would give you live um, additional information, etc. It could see everything you were interacting with and give you interfaces, not just information, but interfaces so that you could click on things and get more information, etc., based on what you were interacting with. Now, after a while, it became clear to me um, this problem of having information at your fingertips is being solved. Uh, smartphones were giving us all access to information wherever we were. Right now, we're still living in these two disconnected worlds, the world online and the world, um, the physical world. But I think soon, uh, augmented reality, uh, Apple supposedly is coming out with a headset and so on. I believe augmented reality and ubiquitous computing will really make the experience more integrated, more seamless, so that information will be more integrated into our physical existence. But I started thinking, well, with all this information at our fingertips, is this really ultimately helping people? Is this really helping people be successful, accomplish the goals they want to accomplish, and so on? And in fact, um, a lot of psychologists, social scientists, and so on, have been documenting um, how awful <laughs> the effects are of having all this information at our fingertips all the time, how bad that has been for our physical health, for our mental health, for our social well-being, and so on. So I started thinking, well, can devices, can systems help us with some of these harder to pin down uh, functions and skills that are very important to be successful in life? Those of you that have kids may be thinking about the same questions, like how can you motivate people? How can you make people more creative? Um, how can you help people stay calm and not get too anxious or stressed? How can we help people with behaviors uh, change and more? So I started working increasingly in these areas because I think it is still very much um, sort of an unsolved issue uh, in the world. Take, for example, critical thinking, teaching people to think more critically. All of us are bombarded by information on phones, television, etc. And so we thought, well, what if we built real-time systems that help people 
with making decisions and deciding on the accuracy of statements that they hear and so on. So we built this like uh, audio-based augmented reality system together with uh, a company, Bose, um, that would constantly listen to statements, <laughs> and or you could also read statements, and it would give you advice on whether those statements were um, true or not. And what we learned is, oh, Great, if a person is assisted by this system that says this is true or this is false, especially when that system also can give you an explanation for why something that you just heard or read is true or false, people tend to then change um, their opinion and uh, they do better in terms of discerning the accuracy of statements. However, we then realized, well, what if the AI system is malicious? What if the AI system gives you bad advice and it tells you that something is true, some fake news, for example, um, and gives you an explanation? Now, it turns out that people still, they, they actually adopt or accept the advice of the AI, even if the AI is wrong. So you see in red, how a person performs in terms of discerning the accuracy, figuring out whether something is true or false, when they are assisted by a malicious AI that gives explanations. AI researchers think that AI is just uh, an engineering problem, but it's very much a human problem as well, and a human design problem. It turns out that just making sure that uh, AI systems give explanations is not an answer to the whole problem because if the explanations are incorrect, then the person will still adopt the advice of the AI if, and they will do worse than if they would without assistance by the AI, which is the gray bars, uh, when, because they just tend to trust systems that give explanations, whether the explanations are bogus or not. So. Um, at the upcoming uh, uh, CHI conference, we will present a paper that shows that AI systems should engage users in thinking. They should force people to think about a problem without immediately giving a suggestion and an explanation. And we show how those types of thing, uh, systems that ask questions first of the user, well, what do you think, or they rephrase, um, the issue and so on, and we show how that type of interface actually results in the best performance of the person assisted with the AI, because the person will think a little bit more about the problem and realize when the AI does not have the right answer. We've also been supporting things like memory and attention. Uh, we're very interested in helping the elderly, for example, uh, who have uh, declining uh, memory. One system we built uses augmented reality to present a set of facts that a person wants to learn and present them in the environment where the person is um, navigating. So, in uh, America, we have the Super Bowl. <laughs> it's kind of like football here. Uh, I mean, a different sport, but equally important. And uh, we had people learn the winners every year of the Super Bowl, which is the like the cup, uh, the World Cup, or they call it World Cup, but it's really just America. <laughs> Um, but um, so people had to learn all the winners each year of the uh, Super Bowl. So the person just walks from the subway, the metro, huh, to their office, and they see things that remind of them of the teams that win consecutively, like the uh, Cowboys, um, the Dolphins, this, that. So they, they walk to MIT and they see, whoa, a cowboy right there <laughs> on the steps, or a panther, and so on. And um, they only have to experience this once, and they can remember the 30 teams perfectly, because they say, well, yeah, I came out of the subway and I saw a jet for the New York Jets, which is one of the teams, or the 
Texas Cowboys, whatever. Um, and it turns out that people don't even forget if they learn um, to memorize something this way. I, I can still recite, and I'm not interested in football, I can still tell you what the winners are because it's more linked to my spatial memory now. So there are many tricks like that that we can use to help people with things like memory. We've also been working on attention. You saw Joe's glasses. We also have been working on glasses that pick up brainwave activity as well as eye gaze, the movement of your eyes. And based on that, we can detect when all of you right now <laughs> are paying attention or not to what I'm saying. And then we can give you feedback like, hey, pay attention <laughs> if you want to pay attention. Of course, you can put on these glasses when you want to be attentive. We don't force you to be attentive. And we showed that people use these glasses, but who use these glasses that give them feedback every time they drift in their attention, they do better in a quiz about the material presented than people uh, who got random um, or, or who were in other control conditions. We've also been working on supporting communication. Uh, one of the systems we built is a silent speech system that picks up um, EMG, which is uh, basically uh, movements of the muscles, minute movements of the muscles, so that you can control your computer, your lights, or you can even say some words based on a neural network recognizing which word you are saying, even though you're not opening your mouth or not making any sound. Um, we actually have been working with uh, patients who have ALS and MS to help them um, basically to communicate. This woman, for example, she cannot make sounds. She can, in her case, still move her mouth, but no sound comes out. And so we built this system that picks up um, the EMG movements and then translates it into um, commands like go to the bathroom, I want to go to the bathroom, I want drops in my eyes, and so on. Um, we've been building communication syst or systems that help people with empathetic communication. Uh, one of the systems, which is now a startup actually, takes a lot of signals of a person or different people in a conversation and it gives feedback and it says, uh, for example, that um, what you are saying is making people more upset or it <laughs> looks at the words that you t uh, use to talk, etc. And it teaches people how to talk in a more empathetic way by picking up all these signals, basically. Uh, from the different speakers, and uh, that system is now uh, being used um, by MIT and evaluated by MIT Human Resources, as well as by uh, NATO to uh, uh, be used actually in real meetings to give feedback to people about uh, how they come over, basically, and whether their, talk, their way of talking is empathetic. We've also been helping people with regulating emotions. Uh, many of us get angry or anxious when we have to give a presentation or whatever. And we have been building systems that again pick up signals, like in this case we're using the Muse for EEG. Um, and uh, we tr uh, train a person to calm themselves down by giving them superpowers in virtual reality if they are able to calm their mind. So we can pick up whether they are calm and focused based on the EEG sensor. And if you are calm and focused, you can make objects levitate. But as soon as you think, what am I gonna make for dinner? The candle will drop. So you learn basically to sustain your attention. We've also been uh, trying to help people with creativity, which is, of course, a very uh, important skill which all of us have as kids, and really all of us have somewhere deep down available to, and accessible, but 
uh, we sort of lose that skill often uh, as adults. So we have been working with um, basically helping people um, with thinking more creatively in, during hypnagogia. Hypnagogia is actually the first stage of sleep. And it turns out that if you talk to a person or if um, an app talks to a person while you are falling asleep, you tend to dream about the topic that you were talked to uh, about as you were falling asleep. So we have shown that if we do this incubation of these hypnagogic dreams, the dreams that happen right when you fall asleep, that uh, we can not only incubate the theme of the dream, but we can also, the person becomes more creative when you then give them problems related to that same theme. Um, they can come up with more creative solutions. By the way, we stole this idea from scientists and artists, people like Dali and Tesla and Edison and so on. They all used this incubation technique uh, to force themselves uh, to think more creatively. Um, we've been working on motivation for learning, another important problem. Um, during the COVID um, uh, sort of uh, era, not finished yet, we started doing more things uh, just on screens again, not just wearable devices. And um, at that time, um, uh, several years ago, uh, generative AI was becoming a thing. We've been, I've been teaching generative AI for four or five years actually now um, at MIT. And um, we realized we could actually um, uh, experiment in the area of learning with generative AI. So one thing we first experimented with is, can we create custom teachers for people? Teachers that may um, and inspire a student more than say uh, an, an, a default teacher. So you can choose. Today, we will learn about quantum mechanics. It is the description of the behavior of matter and light in all its details and, in particular, of the happenings on an atomic so, scale. We can basically create for you automatically the teacher you want, and uh, we do voice cloning even, and so on, so we can, um, uh, you can pick Einstein, Marilyn Monroe, or whoever excites you, and then you can learn from that teacher, basically. And we did an experiment, and this was before Elon Musk became so hated. So I always have to say that now. <laughs> we did this experiment actually a while ago, where we had Elon Musk, a fake, a deep fake of Elon Musk, teach a class, and the exact same class, even the same voice, was uh, used in a non-existing person. That person is totally uh, artificial, but looks real, um, was giving the same class. And it turned out that based on how much people admired Elon Musk, the learning outcomes were totally different. So people wanted to learn more about vaccines. They thought the teacher was a great teacher, etc. even though it was the exact same lecture. We even told them this is a deep fake of Elon Musk, this is not the real Elon Musk who's talking to you, and it made a big difference. Um, now, relevant to the place we are today, Da Vinci Institute, we've also been um, t uh, using some of these same technologies to create more interactive learning experiences. So we decided, um, of course, you all know you can now use ChatGPT or a system like that to uh, talk uh, to Da Vinci or about Da Vinci and so on, but uh, facts are not always correct. So what we did is we uh, built a whole pipeline so that you can take the journals and all the uh, things a person has written about, like Leonardo's journals. You can take a biography about a person as well. And we combine that with GPT-3, so to create a conversational character uh, that basically is Leonardo and that you can just talk to by voice. So. Here's Leonardo. Hello, 
I am an AI-generated living memory of Leonardo da Vinci, an Italian Renaissance polymath. I have had a wide range of interests. Anyway, so you can have this whole um, conversation with him. We are now adding visuals because the initial interaction was only text-based, but you can ask him, like, tell me about your flying machines. Were you ever married? Where did you live? All of that. And the information is correct because it is actually pulled from his journals and pulled from his biography uh, and then run through um, uh, GPT-3 to reframe the information as an answer uh, to the questions that the person is asking and taking into account the context of uh, what the, sister, the person already has talked about with uh, Leonardo. So we'll uh, be pr uh, presenting that work soon at the Intelligent User Interfaces Conference and showed in the technical evaluation like that the system g gives accurate information um, in a very high percentage of the time compared to GPT-3 and also that people, students, prefer to learn about Leonardo this way rather than reading about him or using other means to learn about him. Last, we've been working on helping people with behavior change and especially long-term thinking. As you may know, especially young people have a hard time imagining sort of where they will be 30 years out and um, maybe planning for the future, making the right decisions now for their future self. So we thought, well, what if a person can talk to their future self? <laughs> uh, and we built, again, a whole system, a pipeline, um, where you can uh, basically upload a picture. So you upload a picture and it creates an older version of you. And you also tell the system what you want to accomplish in life. So it asks you some questions um, about your financial um, goals, your professional goals, your family goals. Uh, hobbies and etc. And then we create an older version of you that you can talk to. Um, and you can actually ask your older version, um, well, how did I get from where I am now <laughs> to where you are 30 years from now? Uh, tell me about some great things about your life or less good things and so on. And we use GPT-3 in the background which knows a lot about things like what is it like to be a biology teacher, which is, for example, what this person wants to become, or what is the life of a doctor like, etc. So it really gives you a lot of detail about um, your potential future life. And then we tested um, basically and showed together with Professor Hirschfield, a psychologist who focuses uh, in this area at uh, UCLA, uh, we showed that people think more long term and feel more optimistic about the future after they have been able to talk to a future version of themselves. We're now changing this system so that you can even explore multiple futures, so that a child who's 17, 18, and has to decide what to go study in college can say like, well, what is my life gonna be like if I study this or if I study that? And they can see themselves in the future and decide is this me or is this not me, and so on. Uh, so that's actually the continued work we're doing. So I want to say uh, we have uh, ethical design principles that we use in all this um, intelligence augmentation work. We try to design uh, in collaboration with target users. We enable people rather than forcing technology on them. We try to teach skills to people rather than making them dependent on the technology. Uh, we always try to maximize um, uh, privacy and we have lots and lots of ethics uh, discussions uh, about the systems we built. So even though there's a lot of excitement right now in the world about artificial intelligence, I hope to convince maybe a few people in the audience here today to instead develop AI technologies for the betterment of humanity. 
why should we be developing systems that will surpass and replace us? I can go on and on about all the stupid reasons, really, or stupid <laughs> possible consequences of doing so. Um, I think we should focus on improving humanity, uh, helping people with accomplishing their goals and dreams and with uh, thriving. Thank you.